So here we are in Ambigan Box in Little Lonsdale Street, mm -hmm. just near the Villa Centre, yep. um, the hub of writers in Melbourne. And uh, we're going to talk some more about the book, uh, Blockbuster. Uh, and we were just going to start talking about Hume's influence on true crime. Well, it's, just, it's kind of an interesting process because um, it is alleged that a murder in Manchester in which a young man um, murdered an elderly drunk, mm -hmm. a very rich elderly drunk, probably in the context of picking him up, mm -hmm. um, had something to do with the hansom cab. And this was said in the papers that he'd actually got the idea. Um, however, a slight problem with that is that it's, it's a four-wheeled cab rather than a two-wheeled cab, so it wasn't a hansom cab at all. But still, he might have got the notion of drugging somebody, although in his what he was doing was more robbery than murder. Mm -hmm. Although, come to think of it, in the handsome cab, the intent was initially robbery, so it was a bit of an overlay, but it was certainly noted at the time and added to the book's publicity and notoriety. Because the whole idea of um, Hume's book, which is to post a murder inside a handsome cab, um, was, was loved by the people who went through. Well, it's a really good idea because if you've you'll, you'll have seen Sherlock Holmes films, you've, mm -hmm. you've seen what the handsome cab looks like. So it's yep. like a smart cab, but the driver's outside and at the back, so he can't actually see what's going on inside the cab, and he talks to the passengers via a via a via a, a shutter shutter, um, like a little shutter in the trap window, trap door, yep. trap door in the hood, mm -hmm. and so. You can murder somebody and you, you can get away with it. You can't do that in a cab nowadays um, because you're in the same space as the driver. And it's actually a really brilliant idea. Mm -hmm. And he borrowed it from a French writer called de Borio who had murder in the omnibus. So he clearly is still thinking, you know, what can I do next? Ah, oh, yes, murder in, the, murder in a handsome cab. Mm -hmm. And indeed, there was a book published in Melbourne which was murder, murder in the tram. So mm -hmm. there you go. And there was also, um, some, I believe he used chloroform, the, the killer in mm. The Street of Handsome Cabbies, who won't reveal, um, mm. but I believe the killer used chloroform to yeah. kill his victim. Well, it was originally used in anaesthetics, but if you don't mm -hmm. get the, but it's again, it's, if you don't get the dosage right, or you're just casually using it, um, you could buy it from a chemist. And it's very easy to kill someone just by putting it, you render them unconscious and the dosage is too high and this um, brings on cardiac arrest. And something similar happened in this true crime event in Manchester. Oh yes, um, he had a, the man concerned had a bad heart and he died. Mm. Um, but yeah, it's a life irritating night. Uh, there's a fantastic line on page one of your book uh, which hooked me in straight away. Mm. And um, you say, our destination, the mean streets of crime fiction history. Uh, and indeed, so many destinations in Melbourne um, that exist in Hume's book um, and existed at the time that Hume's book was written um, still exist today in one form or another. Yep. Parliament House, the Melbourne Club. Um, we're in Little Lonsdale now, and at the other end of it is the slums in which Hume walked getting information for his book and in which he sends his police officers and the various detectives in the hansom cab. Mm -hmm. These days it's been cleaned up, it's now accommodation, but it was a rough area. There was opium dens, there was prostitution, it was pretty dangerous. And the thing was, it was only a block away from high society. Um, the theatres and Holland Street, which is the sort of the richest area. And, um, but you can walk around Melbourne now and there's still quite a lot of Hume's Melbourne surviving. The, well, I mean, the, the, uh, the Scots Church is beginning and the Burke and Wills Monument, although that's been moved. But he might, you could recognise his Melbourne now, now if he came back. Hmm. Uh, Hume, Hume liked to put a lot of in-jokes uh, and digs into his work, such as the Scots Church, as you were saying. Well, it's it's a Presbyterian church, mm -hmm. and he was in Dunedin, which is a very Presbyterian city. Uh, he, I don't think he had much time for the Presbyterians, but by putting public drunkenness in their vicinity at in the, the scene of the book, 
at the, at the opening scene of the book, um, which and a book which take goes into some very seamy depths from bigamy, prostitution, crime, drug addiction, all this area. Um, it's, it's actually rather naughty. It's this precisely the sort of thing to annoy the pious of Melbourne, and indeed when he was shipping around to publishers, this was one thing they, they didn't like, that he'd cho chosen to show the worst of human nature and human Melbourne. In front of the pious of Scots Church. Yeah, exactly, and of course across from there was the Congregational Church, which was equally teetotal. But at the same time, it was these very things, the prostitution, the bigamy, um, that uh, for, for only that sensationalist genre, and it's in fact what was part of why people wanted to read well, oh look, people people like to read about um, the low life even now. I mean, it's, a, <laughs> it's a it's part of our nature, I think. Is, oh, it's, it's human it's human nature. We love this sort of stuff. Okay, uh, speaking of which, uh, you refer to the term moral management yeah. um, as a method of um, managing the lunatic asylum, um, which Hume's father um, ran. What yeah. is what is moral management? Moral management is a means of, in the days before you had psychotropic drugs, mm -hmm. it was about managing the insane, not by locking them away, but by good food, um, what we would now call sort of occupational therapy, mm -hmm. um, gardening, baking, sewing, um, treating, putting them in decent surroundings, gardens, and this was came from the French Revolution, from the Quakers. It came from two directions, and it had results. It really did in that treating the insane humanely, given that they couldn't give them the drugs that we now do. Mm -hmm. It actually had quite a high success rate, and so Hume's father, who ran the Dunedin Lunatic Asylum and lived on the premises, the entire family lived on the premises. You know what a marvelous. <laughs> basis to be a crime writer. Yes. Um, you also had music coming into the, into the asylum and you also had theatre, theatre troops, would, amateur theatre troops would perform for the um, inmates and that was how Hume sisters became interested in music and became opera singers. Mm -hmm. His sister Mary who came to Melbourne with the idea of becoming a famous soprano Unfortunately, Nelly Melba was there, and Nelly Melba was amazing. Amazing, yes. Um, Mary Hume was good, but not that good. Mm -hmm. And Fergus, he got it. He got the theatre bug from the asylum performances, and so he decided that that's what he wanted to do. He wanted to become a playwright. Um, but unfortunately, his father, who was a rather respectful man, said he was also Presbyterian. Presbyterian. Mm -hmm. He said, "Laddie, and I'm not going to imitate a Scotch accent. <laughs> no, get yourself through university first. Then we'll have to think about this." And so he went through an entire law degree, which he hated, but again, what a wonderful preparation for a crime writer. And in fact, in Dunedin, he proceeded to write plays, get them performed by visiting troops from Australia and from England. And that was the impetus for him to go to Melbourne and see if he could get his plays performed in Melbourne. Because I believe he was actually publishing a book in an effort to actually become a famous playwright, sort of like yeah. as a sideways way into the he had a lot of lateral thinking, did he? Um, he came to Melbourne, but J.C. Williamson had a monopoly, and it was a really there was a lot of theatre going on, but it was all often supplied by overseas plays imported, like Gilbert and Sullivan, or a few local playwrights. And he couldn't get in; he couldn't get in. He was unknown, so he thought what he'd do was that he'd write a book, and they couldn't ignore him. And that's why he wrote the Handsome Cat. He literally walked down to a bookseller and said, what's selling? And they said the novels of Gaboriau, who was a French crime writer and essentially the, inv the inventor of the police procedural. And what Gaboriau did was um, write these very tightly focused crime novels, focused on the detective. And these had come out in the 1870s. They took about 10 years to be translated in England, but when they did, um, they really took off, and so the novels of the Gaboriau in translation were selling the biggest sellers in Melbourne at that time. So Hume bought all of them, took them home, read them, and said, what I'm going to do is do something likewise. And he had the wit to realise that in crime fiction, the setting is crucial in that it's 
the determines what happens, and it's almost like a character in the books. So for Poe, it's Paris. For um, Gaborio, again, it was Paris. And for Colin Doyle, it would be London. But Hume sets it slap in the middle of Melbourne, which is a very interesting city at the time, one of the richest in the Southern Hemisphere, if not um, the world. Mm -hmm. It was very large. It was a population of nearly 400,000, big for the time. It was going undergoing a boom town. And so he familiarised himself with Melbourne. He walked the streets. He went into the, into the high society. He went into the slums and with his notebook, taking notes. And he determined, the very, he, he sort of noticed that people in Melbourne had re essentially remade themselves. They'd come out from the colonies and sometimes they'd come out from England to the colonies and sometimes in that case they'd um, left behind other associations like my great grandmother was illegitimate. She came to Melbourne as a teenager and she married an MP. Nobody in the family knew that she didn't know who her father was. Um, and so he was just back in the history. Yeah, and so he, so there was a lot of illegitimacy, there was a lot of bigamy. Um, people left their wives behind in England and came to Australia and discovered and got married again. There was um, very rich, but there was the, the awareness that suddenly from England could come a ship with unwelcome news and that all this prosperity or respectability was built on sand. It might disappear overnight. In fact, if I um, recall from your book, you actually mentioned that at around the time um, he wrote his book, mm. there was actually a lot of speculation um, in the real estate market and in fact there was a housing bubble. Very much. Um, in fact, Melbourne's land was changing hands at an incredible rate, particularly the CBD. And arguably he senses that it's not going to last and it doesn't. Come the 1890s there's a major subprime crisis and it puts the city into depression and it's never quite the same again. Mm. Um, and thereafter Sydney becomes the biggest city in, in, in Australia. But at that point Melbourne was leading. Mm. Um, you actually described Melbourne um, at the time as a uh, cosmopolitan in their tastes, uh, stylish, flashy and fun-loving, um, as well as enthusiastic consumers of sport and liquor. And um, they're also later mentioned as being highly literate, uh, book-loving population with a disposable income. That sounds like Melbourne today. Pretty much so. Um, even in the 1860s it was noted that the um, Melbourne had a huge appetite for books and that's certainly true and then when we come to look at the 1880s, 20 years later, there's all these bookshops. There's Cole's um, Book Arcade which is a emporium of the books in Burke Street. Um, there's bookshops everywhere ranging from religious to um, advanced which meant that they'd cover areas like theosophy which is belief in reincarnation which Hume became a devotee <laughs> or um, new ideas like socialism and anti-vaccination was mm. prevalent even in those days. So there was a great appetite for books and there wasn't much competition because there was no radio, no television. People went out to the theatre a lot but they'd also read and it was seen as social advancement that you became literate and you read. And because the population they'd had compulsory primary schooling, schooling. so the population was pretty much, they had something close to 90% literacy in Melbourne. Mm -hmm. And um, there was also the uh, interesting characters of Melbourne. We have interesting characters now. They had interesting characters then, such as Madame Brossel. Is that what you Madame said? Madame Brussels, yep. And she was married to, she was a high-class uh, brothel owner. Oh, yes. But her husband was a policeman. That was, well, yes, estranged husband was a policeman. Right. Um, her boyfriend, Alfred Plumpton, who collaborated with Hume and they wrote um, comic operas together. Her boyfriend was actually um, choir master of St. Patrick's Cathedral, while also teaching music at Presbyterian Ladies College. <laughs> and nobody knew that his girlfriend, he had a wife as well, Yes. Um, but his girlfriend was running the most exclusive brothel <laughs> in Melbourne. Um, nor that he was acting as a bit of a pimp for the right, brothel. Right. Uh, and he knew Hume. Um, 
it's, uh, it's entirely possible that um, Hume knew Madame Grosses as well, mm. although I doubt that he was a consumer. He was a rather prim character, and he very much expresses his sympathy for fallen women and women who've been strayed into, prosti strayed into prostitution, like Sal in the handsome cap. And in this case, he's quite forward-thinking because in the Victorian era, once you were a wanton woman, you were, um, you know, to be shunned. And, mm. and possibly end up like Sal does in the book um, at the end. Well, she ends up running a home for fallen women, which is, mm. you know, commendable. Um, but quite often it might be drug addiction or falling into the air or while drunk. Mm. So, um, also there was, I believe, some rumours about uh, Hume's uh, personal preferences. It's really difficult to say, um, but there are quite, he never married, never mentioned having a, um, a sweetheart, but he, um, certainly some of his novels are quite homoerotic. And when in, uh, when, when in Melbourne, he would have been, there was, you know, gay, gay men were everywhere at that time. They were just hiding. And you can see this in the film version of The Handsome Cap in 2012, where in the slum scenes there's prostitutes in drag. Um, but the fact is that um, Hume met a young man in Sydney uh, who became one of the most famous gays of the time. And he was subsequently arrested at the Melbourne General Exhibition after Hume had left Australia soliciting in drag, so not really very far from this, this young man was soliciting in drag and he was arrested by the police for soliciting and they discovered that it, he was actually a man. Um, and it is recorded that Hume had given him 20 pounds. This was a large sum of money in those days. Yes, yeah, you could, it was like a third, it was like a economy travel to Europe, you mm -hmm. could make a deposit in the house. Um, it was far above quarters and rates and I speculated about this with Ke Kerry Greenwood, and Kerry said, "Well, it could have been blackmail. It could have been, um, it could have been infatuation. But at that time, um, homosexuality was a criminalised, and for most of the 19th century, sodomy was a, was a death offence. But you could only prove that they were caught in the act. Which, but then they subsequently criminalised." Um, indecent acts between men which could cover a variety of behaviour mm -hmm. and that was what got Oscar Wilde. So there was good reason to be cautious and certainly Wilde was blackmailed before he, he and Alfred Douglas before he was eventually had up before the um, police. So there was reason to believe that he might have been blackmailed. By that, that person. Yeah. yeah. Um, so Hume himself um, is actually a very interesting fellow. Uh, so you basically describe him as a very um, enterprising character, um, always putting himself forward, and uh, he had some innovative ideas on how to promote um, the mystery of the handsome crab, which may have contributed to its success. He's clearly bright. He's very educated. Um, he's quite. Um, he sort of thinks laterally. There were ideas, how the handsome cab was promoted it might not have been his idea, it could have been of his, the man who eventually was his publishing part partner who was Frederick Trishler. Mm -hmm. And Frederick Trishler had been a merchant seaman, he'd come to ground in, in uh, Christchurch where he'd married, he'd become a pawnbroker, gone bankrupt, but he'd subsequently come to Melbourne, he'd gained experience in the publishing industry. And Trishler had worked as an advertising manager for a publisher, so he understood publicity. And he realised that you, you, you'd lay it on thick and you'd get results. So it is recorded that Hume, when the Handsome Cab came out, that he was um, actually delivered the books to publishers in a Handsome Cab and then went dashing around the sub suburbs in a, in advertisement, probably with a banner. Um, so this could have been Trishler's idea, but it's it w it certainly worked. And they also, I believe, published it um, on uh, Melbourne Cup Day. 
when Melbourne's population just increases. They had a enormous turnout in Melbourne Cup that year. It was a very fine day. The book was out. It had already been reviewed. They were they, most likely they would have gone to the railway booksellers. They would have had a display. I wouldn't have put it past them to be selling it at the Cup from... And you think about it, a book with a horse in the cover, what a better thing to bring out during Cup Week. Mm -hmm. And something happened. We don't know exactly what the initial print run was. Um, generally, the historians of the book say, oh, it couldn't have been more than 200 copies. Um, publishers say, modern-day publishers say, oh, yes, it could be, and cite examples of books that take off. Trishla and Hume said it was 5,000 copies, which was a huge amount. Even now, that's a, that's a, that's a run for a, a popular Australian novel. But um, whatever the print run was, it's, it sold out very quickly. Mm -hmm. And from that, Trishla got the idea that maybe I should take this to England and see what happens, whether we can get it to sell out in England, which it did. It did. Amazingly so. So, Lucy, um, you're similar to Hume in that uh, you were born in uh, New Zealand mm -hmm. and then you came out to Australia. Um, well, but by academic parents, I moved around the place, so North Queensland, France, England, mm -hmm. um, but then came back to um, Melbourne, where, curiously enough, I've got early roots in that most of my ancestors were from Melbourne mm -hmm. and from the 1840s onwards, so mm -hmm. fa fairly early on. So I can walk the streets of Melbourne and get a sense of my ancestors who possibly passed Hume in the street. Wow. And um, it's very much the 19th century Melbourne as well still. Mm. So uh, Blockbuster is not your first foray um, into writing about the history of crime fiction. Uh, in 2010, you published uh, Women Writers and Detectives in 19th Century Crime Fiction. Well, I wrote that book because I'd been researching Mary Fortune and she was a Canadian woman who came to... Australia uh, during the gold rush period and like characters in human novels she was a bigamist and she ma and like Madame Brussel she married a policeman but from her po uh, her police experience she gained enough moose and knowledge to be able to write police procedurals so from the 1860s onwards she was writing the detectives album which was a one of the longest, it was the longest running detective series in the 19th century. It went from the 1860s to 1909 when she vanishes, the lady oh. vanishes. And um, it was every month in the Australian Journal, which is a popular fiction magazine. And Hume read her, would have read her. He certainly knew about her because while he was in Melbourne, her son got arrested for bank robbery. Mm. And it was all over the news that, gosh, his mother writes detective stories. You know, and this bad influence. Again, back to this whole thing of crime fiction potentially influencing real absolutely, life. And, absolutely. And people being very concerned about that influence on society. Yep, and you can see that in newspaper editorials to these days. Uh, do you have any favourite modern crime authors? Um, I like um, Arnalda, Arnalda Indra Darson, who's from Iceland. Mm -hmm. Um, I like Honey, Honey Brown, who's um, pretty much my favourite psychological writer mm -hmm. of crime fiction. She's Australian. Mm -hmm. And um, I like Qiu Xiaolong, who writes detective series set in Shanghai. So mm -hmm. this is all stuff I come across by reviewing. And crime fiction, then and now, is of very high quality. How do you think that Hume's uh, book would stand up by today's standards of writing? Depends. Um, it's whether you um, whether you've got a taste for nineteenth century, or whether you've got a taste for history. The people, some people think read it now and think, oh, this is a bit old fashioned. I can guess the villain. Some people don't, and some people really love the uh, evocation of, of Melbourne. And but it is an important book for crime fiction history and it had a huge influence. Mm -hmm. So we should never forget that. I personally can read it and pick out every time I, I pick out something new because he's a very witty writer and he's most amusing. So I can read it again and again and there's something there or even a sort of self-illusion um, like his putting his real address into the book <laughs> <laughs> or a New Zealand politician who happened to annoy him. Um, and I get a lot out of it and I think people do. 
uh, your first adult novel, uh, The Scarlet Rider, seems to sum up your um, interests in writing. Um, it, apparently it uh, is about biography, uh, Victorian de detective fiction, uh, voodoo and adults. Tell us a bit more about this book. It's been reissued this year by Ticonderoga Press mm -hmm. um, and um, it was about trying to get Mary Fortune out of my hair <laughs> and that I didn't, I had a lot of information about her right stories but I didn't have very much information about the person that was missing. Um, and you know, she was a bigamist, she had an illegitimate child, she was on the gold fields, her son was a criminal, she vanished, but there wasn't enough to write a biography like you do with Kim. So I, I tried to write it as a novel with the sense that you get if you get too close to your biographical subject sometimes being haunted, <laughs> which is what I got from her, a sense of a deep identification. But I didn't get it from Kim. I could actually step away from him and um, regard him a bit more dispassionately. Mm. Um, but I was definitely had this feeling of being haunted by fortune, so I thought I'd write a ghost story. So what's next for you, Lucy? Oh, look, there's any number of, any number of projects. With poss there's, um, uh, there's possibly a book about my 19th century ancestors. Mm -hmm. and there's um, possibly a book about an infanticide in the 19th century. And there's a novel which um, has 19th century, a female detective, and uh, shapeshifters. Wow, fantastic. So we shall see. We shall see. Very excited and look forward to, to hearing about uh, your further publications in the thank future. Thank you. And thank you for letting us interview you today. Thank you. Thank you. It's been a pleasure to host uh, the Melbourne of your books and the interview of Lucy Sussex out in Bigham Books. Um, hope to see you sometime. Thanks very much. And where can we find you? If we're, uh... we're on Little Lonsdale Street mm -hmm. between Swanson Street and Russell Street. Cool. Thank you. All right.